In this video, we're going to start diving into the Fusion page of Resolve. So specifically, we're going to take this video clip here, go over to the Fusion page, show a few nodes and what you can use the nodes for in applying effects to a base video clip. So on the edit page here, what we're looking at is nothing but a simple video clip that was put onto the timeline. Nothing else has been done to it. And if we want to edit it on the Fusion page, we simply have it selected and then go over to the Fusion page, which is the fourth one in the middle at the bottom. So you jump into the Fusion page with a clip selected. You should see a media in and a media out. So media in is essentially your source video and then media out is what the final result should be after it goes through the Fusion editor. So in between here, you're able to add Fusion nodes, which can generate certain highly customizable effects that you might want to include on your clips. Also, from the nature of nodes, being able to connect nodes to other nodes and merge them together with a merge node, you can also include many different effects before having your final media out. As long as you merge everything back together before the end, you can include a lot of stuff here. So one really simple example for a node here would be a blur node. Now, of course, back on the edit page, you can use the effects library to add blurs like a Gaussian blur. One of the reasons you might decide to do it on the Fusion page instead is that you can link another node to your blur node, such as a mask shape, to cause the blur to only impact part of your video frame and not the entire picture. So if I have media one selected, and then I go up here and find a blur node on the toolbar up here. I can left click and because I have media one selected, it'll try to find the best place to add the blur node to along this chain. So you see how the output of media one now feeds into blur one and the output from blur one feeds to media out, which means that before going to the final output, it needs to have the blur effect first. You can also see on the blur node that there is a little blue triangle here for the effect mask. So this is another import node for the blur node where you can optionally add a shape to the blur so that, as I mentioned before, it affects a certain area of your screen. Let's show this time how it would look like if you add a node without having a node already selected. So if I go up here to the toolbar, I could click on rectangle or ellipse for a simple shape. So I'll choose ellipse here. And with this ellipse node, you can see when it's selected that we have gizmos in the preview window to go ahead and edit it. So the screen line here is the outline of the shape of our mask layer. In the node section, you can see that the node has been added here, but it's not connected to anything. So if we tried to render with this setup, the ellipse node wouldn't actually do anything. So to connect it to the blur node, we need to take this gray rectangular box, which is the output connector, and then connect it to the blue triangle down below for the blur. So this means that the ellipse is going to be serving as the masking shape for the blur node. Now, if I go back to the blur node, I can set up the blur. So let's go ahead and increase the blur size. So as I increase the blur size, it becomes a stronger and stronger blur. But you'll notice the blur only happens inside of this ellipse shape. Now, just like in other pages of Resolve, it's possible to keyframe animate the nodes themselves. So if I click on the ellipse node, then you'll see a center X and center Y position for that circle. So inside of the preview window, I'll control and then scroll on my middle mouse wheel out so that we can see a bigger picture. And let's go to the first frame of this. Let's go to the first frame of this clip here. So all the way back at the start where we might have a transition and I will take this blur shape and move it off the center. So at this point in time, there is no blur in the center because the ellipse is not inside of the frame. Now I can keyframe here to set that as the starting point. Then we can go 24 or 30 frames in to this clip for about uh, one second of animation. And now if I adjust the position of this box, I can use the gizmos or the settings in the inspector, then a new keyframe will be created and we'll get an animation out of it. So I'm going to left click on the X center gizmo here and drag this over here to the right. Note that it also shows you the path that the circle is going to be following across time. So basically another visual indicator there. Now I can go to frame zero where it's off center off the entire video frame entirely, as a matter of fact, and I can hit play to watch the animation of that circle moving on to the center of the screen. So we animate the property on one node, the ellipse, which serves as a mask. 
And that's going to affect the output that we have with the blur node because the blur depends on that ellipse node. So hopefully this example gives you a bit of an idea of how you can chain your nodes together to get certain results. Let's show another way now to add nodes. So you have your basic nodes up here in this toolbar, but there's actually a lot more inside of Resolve. So I can right click, go to add tool, and there are many categories of nodes that you can build custom effects inside of Resolve for. One of the new types in Resolve 17 are vector shape nodes. So with vector shapes, it's easy to add simple 2D graphics to your video clips. For this category though, as well as 3D nodes, the setup is a little bit different because you have to also have a special render node. So for shapes, it's a S render node. So whatever you set up with your vector shape nodes has to go through a S render before it goes to the media out. Let's start with a simple shape node here. I'll do a S rectangle. So it's a rectangle shape as a vector. Now, normally, if you want to preview how your setup looks at a specific step, you can left click on these little circles that are below each of the nodes. So I could pop the S rectangle into the left view. Once you left click it and you see that white circle, that means that it is on the left or the right view. With vector shape nodes specifically, though, you can't actually see anything until it gets rendered. So if I right click and add a tool, let's go to shape and then S render. I will connect the S rectangle to the S render. And now I'll left click on that preview circle, the left view, and we'll be able to see our graphic rendered to the screen. So we can see here, it's just a simple little white circle. I can click back on the S rectangle node if I wanna change some settings about that. Maybe I want the corners to curve around a little bit. So we could add a corner radius. We could go to style if we want to change the color. So let's just adjust that a little bit. But obviously at this point in time, you can tell that the media out does not have this blue box inside of it. So the media out is previewing on the right and it has the blur because the blur and the ellipse, that's all part of our chain that leads to media out. So we need to find a way to mix in the blur but also with the S render. And what we would use for that is a merge node. So the quickest way to get it would probably be to left click on the blur, and then I'm going to right click on the line in front of it to make sure that the merge node gets added to that line. Go to add tool, and then let's go to composite and merge. So our merge node appears on the way to media out. The yellow connector ends up being the background or what shows in back. And then the green connector is the foreground or what would show on top. So if you are merging nodes together and you have a title, you would probably put that in the foreground so that it renders over any of the background video because the background video would hide anything that was beneath it in terms of layering. So let's take the S render now and connect that to the green foreground connector. And now our box is going to appear on screen. So if I left click on the rectangle, I get all of the gizmos I need to adjust this little rectangle. Let's move it around on the screen. You can see as I move it off center that the blur is still there in the background. So we're already combining multiple effects in one output. I might want to shrink the size of this square now. So I'll lower the width and height to something kind of tiny. So I can just throw it in one of the corners and let's adjust its position with the gizmos over here. Usually it's a little bit easier to visually adjust things with the gizmos, unless you need a very specific value, which you can always type it in in the inspector. So now if we go to the start and hit play, we have a little animation, our lip slides into the circle, and we have a random blue brick, and we have a blue vector uh, rectangle on the top left. Now, one thing you'll notice that when we're hitting play is that a lot of these nodes are flashing green and it's taking a very long time to move through this timeline. So on the Fusion page, these effects need to be rendered out and it needs to render any updates on a frame by frame basis. So it can take quite a while for an effect to get pre-rendered here so that you can actually play it back smoothly in the timeline. So we've kind of rendered the first 200 seconds here. If I go to the start here and I hit play. So unless your video effects in the Fusion page get cached, so unless your Fusion effects have been cached and that the effects have been pre-rendered and that they're all currently in memory, and you can check uh, playback and then render cache and Fusion memory cache to make sure that those are functioning correctly. 
So I believe that user for render cache is the default here and then Fusion Memory Cache Auto. If they are cached, then you should see a green bar here on the Fusion page timeline. And then you should be able to play it back in real time without the slowness of basically needing to render as you play. But if it's not cached, then it's gonna play back pretty slowly, obviously, since it's rendering everything on a frame by frame basis. You don't really need to worry about that though. When you actually export your video project, everything will be rendered and the video should play back at the timeline speed which you actually set your project up for. So if it's 24 frames per second, it should take one second to play 24 frames once it's exported. One more fun tool we'll throw in for this video. For the vector shape nodes, there are also nodes that can interact on the base node. So if you have a rectangle node, you could duplicate that many times by selecting your shape node, right clicking on the line to add the new node to the right spot. Go to add tool, shape, and let's do a grid node. So when we have a grid, it's gonna duplicate the original shape many times, and we can set how many copies there should be, what the offset should be as well. So let's just go ahead and play around with this with the count here. Perhaps we go back to the rectangle node and we also adjust the location of the original node here. And then let's bring that onto the screen. On S grid, I will lower the Y offset to bring them closer together. And so just like that, you can create not one, but 12 rectangular squares. So obviously with vector shape nodes, they could easily be the base for something like a custom video title. So with vector shape nodes, it would be really easy to do things like create video titles and then having these shapes serve as some kind of background and maybe you layer the text over them, just as one example for what might be possible. So in the next video, we're gonna be talking about creating a simple custom title inside of DaVinci Resolve 17.